Hello, and welcome to Friends for Life, a podcast of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod's Life Ministry. We're sharing the stories and insights of real people living out God's love for the people He's created. We hope you'll stick around and be our friends for life. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm your host, Steph Nugebauer, here with my co-host and the director of LCMS Life Ministry, Deaconess Dr. Tiffany Manor. Our guests today are Penny Lochran and her dad, Pastor Kevin Lochran of St. Petersburg, Florida. Welcome to both of you. Thank you very much, Steph. We're very happy to be here and happy to be with uh, our good friend, too, Deaconess. Good to see you. Thanks for taking time to talk with our listeners and with me and Tiffany today. I am going to let you introduce yourselves, if you would. And listeners, in in short time, you will see why Pastor and Penny are our newest friends for life. So if you could introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Penny. Well, I'm the main reason why I'm on this podcast right now, is because I was a, not sure the exact here, but I was a baby, so I was not born on my birthday. I was born before I was supposed to be, if that makes any sense. How big were you when you were born? Three pounds ish. Okay, very good. And what happened to you? And when I was like, Three days old, I had a plane plane, and that's why I have so many Great. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, sweetie. All right. Well, I'm Pastor Lochran, Kevin Lochran. I'm the senior pastor at Grace Lutheran Church and School in beautiful St. Petersburg, Florida, where it's been doing nothing but raining uh, the last few days. I have no idea where that's coming from because often we go day after day after day after day of sunshine. Uh, but Grace St. Pete's my third uh, parish that I've served. However, I've been here for 16 years now. Uh, so I've been here for some time. Well, and I can vouch for the beauty of Grace Lutheran Church and School in, in St. Peter's, Florida. I've gotten to um, worship there several times. I actually um, got to uh, no pastor and, and um, become uh, friends for life with him um, through the Concordia Deaconess Conference. Mm-hmm. And then I uh, hadn't ever been at his place up until about a year ago. And now I've been there several times um, and, and have been able to meet Penny and get to know her a, a little bit, not a lot. So I, I'm in, um, really looking forward to this conversation to get to know Penny a little bit better. Because when I've been at church um, there visiting my family, it's always been a, a little bit rushed <laughs> when we're leaving. <laughs> yeah, Grace is up beautiful sanctuary, beautiful stained glass, but the people are just lovely. (laughs) Yeah, we're a little prejudiced, but we too really enjoy our people. We especially like our deaconess, by the way, (laughs) uh, who happens to be Tiffany's daughter. So uh, we're blessed to have uh, Tiffany's daughter, Marissa, Deaconess Marissa, that serves there, uh, her son-in-law, Andrew, and that, of course, her granddaughter, Clarice. And we've got a grandson on the way soon too. So we're very yeah. excited. Uh, yeah, we're excited for you, uh, for your entire family. Yeah. Can't be the, wait to be there um, soon and, and um, hold that little baby and um, and you know have the baptism at, at Grace. Um, and you, I mean, well, we're not really talking about deaconesses today, but I mean, Grace has a d- distinction of having uh, multiple deaconesses. I mean, you've, you've had many over the years, um, but right now you've got a deaconess and an intern. So that um, makes Grace a pretty special church, too, that they've got a lot of mercy in this. I don't think there are that many uh, parishes that, that, that have two deaconesses. So we have a deaconess and a deaconess intern. Um, so Deaconess May is there as well, too, and, and she adds some spice beyond a shadow of a doubt. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking time again to be on with us. And Penny, you started off by sharing about your birth. You were born early and then with cerebral palsy. Penny, what language do you use to describe your range of abilities? Oh, I... I just simply say that 
Other than being in a wheelchair, I don't really like anything that not being in a wheelchair people do. And I relatively normal state. You know, being in a wheelchair and having CP. CP. Yep. Yep. So sometimes Penny will, um, as we may have just noticed there, uh, sometimes she'll have just a little lag uh, when she's talking. That's not the computer lagging on us. We've had a few technical difficulties already today, uh, but rather, we were told when she was born that she would never be able to walk or talk. Um, that the, ble the bleeding in her brain had damaged those centers. Uh, however, in her particular case, a different part of the brain from normal is, is, has picked up the speech uh, patterns. At least that's what the uh, doctor described for us. So sometimes when she goes to talk, there's kind of a lag because she's using a different part of her brain for the rest of us. Yeah. That's pretty amazing, actually. That, I mean, you've got a, an extra special brain that's um, able to, to pick up and do things that, um, you know, earthly physicians never, never anticipated. Wow, that, that's really impressive. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I'm glad I can talk because if I couldn't, that would be so frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. And she does have quite a lot to say. So it, it is a blessing. Uh, it was very fascinating. Uh, when she was about two and a half, uh, they sent a school psychologist to uh, evaluate her for an early intervention program that she wouldn't be a part of, right? And because she, she couldn't speak at that time, he brought pictures. And after about 20 minutes, he got. He got frustrated and he looked at my wife and he said, you didn't tell me she knew how to read. So, so we didn't know. Um, because I couldn't talk at that point. How could they know that I knew? Because you were reading the names of the things that he was showing you on the picture. So, yeah. So he had to wow. come back with a different set of stuff. Yeah, <laughs> so it's like you're At, too you're yeah. too smart for what I brought with me. I need to I, I need yeah. to bring more advanced. Wow, <laughs> exactly. We were we were amazed, and even once she started talking in earnest, she was probably around four ish, and um, I mean, she had the a full range of vocabulary that a four year old would would have. It wasn't the you know, she didn't start with the babbling stage or any of those things. She just went right to sentences and boom. Penny, of course, you belong to Grace because that's where your dad is a pastor. Now, how has Grace opened its arms to you and embraced your various abilities too? Well, I actually went to a uh, Grace has a school, and I actually went there for a middle school, and I was in, like, every year they had to, like, a two-year version of a well-known Broadway musical. I was, and Mrs. Tippett always all made sure I had a car in her, so. I'm a musical theater for lack of a better word. So that was nice. <laughs> yeah, she 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 had an especially memorable role during the Wizard of Oz. She was the tornado. They put <gasps> oh, yeah. yeah, they put streamers wow. on the back of her wheelchair, used a black light, and and one of the kids actors on stage went around and around with her and it really looked as if she were the lady in the rocking chair in a tornado. It was, it was pretty <laughs> clever. Yeah. That is so cool. I would have loved to see that. 
What were some other what were, what were some other things that that um and trying to remember that was so long ago. Oh. Oh. Well. <laughs> Can you remember? Well, think of the how about the physical surrounding of the campus? Is it is it pretty uh accessible, would you say? Yeah, yeah. I would say, yeah. I mean, even the sanctuary, how is it to move around the sanctuary? It's pretty easy. I'm pulling as I know well into the pew. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so Penny operates a motorized chair, uh, so she can. You're able to come up for communion yourself, Martin. Yeah, yeah. And, and when she was going to school and singing in the choir, our choir director built a ramp so she could get up, uh, not all the way up to the balcony, but when they, when the scholars, the young kids would sing up front, the choristers, she could wheel right up into the staging area the sanctuary area the first step of that and and be next to her choir mate uh i'd say overall everybody's done a pretty good check she even ran the mile yeah and well she was going to school <laughs> oh and what about now as um someone who's you know uh, moved on from grace lutheran school what about um with with the life of the church how are you you connected to the body of christ and, and the life of the church at Grace Lutheran? Well, I volunteer a lot, like sometimes I'll even, if I get to church, even a lot early, so early enough, I'll even greet people that are coming in, or I volunteer to be here. And then I, um, not recently because of some Arnold, Arnold real struggles that I've had, but my mom used to be part of the mission outreach board, and they have an annual Christmas dinner, so I would help with that. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. And Penny, do you enjoy singing still in the choir? Yeah. It's hard because I don't really, I'm not really sure what kind of choir means, if that makes sense. Well, getting up to balcony is difficult, but she has sung in choir right when they're downstairs. Yeah. What do you do now? What's that cool where they go on? Yeah. They have this week. Grace has a tradition on Christmas Eve of doing a Quempus uh, carol where uh, the joy choir, which are the women in the choir, are are quadrant off in the four corners of the church uh, and they sing angels we have heard on high and then they move from station to station holding candles and Penny's been a part of that several times. I was there last year for that and it was it was beautiful and I was like oh I, I had goosebumps yeah. Penny then I assume that you did you have confirmation class with yeah. your dad or with a different pastor at Grace? That was, okay. That and what was, was that very like? Fun. It was <laughs> weird. Like, oh, you didn't know the thing with dad. Now he's one. You're in, you go know, into acting with him in a semi formal situation and knowing he's like, yeah, that was kind of awkward. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've heard PK say that before. Okay, so here's the qu the real question for, for any pastor's kid. Does your dad answer you faster at church if you say dad or if you say pastor? Probably dad. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> Tiffany, what did the statistics show? 
I, I, I have to give it to Pastor Lachram because um, most most of the time we hear PKs say, oh, I have to say pastor to get his attention at church <laughs> when we're at church. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, that that might even bleed a little bit into what it's like to be a parent of a, of a child that's, that's able to differently, right? You know, yeah. I'm pretty attuned to hearing Patty when she when she calls for me. So I, I I would wonder what her siblings might say if you asked them the same question. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. That's a good point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And speaking of siblings, do you have three older siblings, Penny? That's a bit of a loaded question. Okay, if you count my legal siblings, there's four of us, there's me, and then there's my biological brother, John, and then there's my adopted brother, Matt, and then my adopted sister. Thing, but there's a bunch of foster kids that mom and dad never legally adopted per se that still consider them mom and dad. So, really, total, I'm probably the 21st of like 21. Yeah. There's no really time number like that. <laughs> wow. Wow. So then that would mean that Pastor you and your wife have had 16 foster children yes, as well. Yes, correct? besides our, yeah, 16, wow. 17. You know, it, some of them were very brief, but uh, we probably had a dozen that were with us for at least a year. Not at the, not at the same time. <laughs> But, but, but even our two adopted, um, our, our two legally adopted children, Justine and Matt, uh, were a bit older when we adopted them. They were foster children that became adoptable. Uh, actually, we knew Matt was adoptable when he first came to live with us. Uh, I think he was about seven. So he and, uh, and, and John, it's as if they're twins. They're there within months of each other. Yeah. 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 So, and they relate to each other kind of like twins would relate to one another. <laughs> yeah, she and Matt were always especially close, particularly when she was younger. I, you know, I don't know if it means anything, but it was it was really interesting when Penny was born because of the premature birth. John was actually out of town. Um visiting with my mother in Arizona. Everybody would take turns in the summer months uh, going to Arizona. So it happened to be John's turn to be there. And the first one uh, to hold any other than I uh, was Matthew. Uh, Because Kirsty, it was a C-section. Kirsty was stuck in the hospital in Sheboygan. Penny was in the hospital in Milwaukee an hour away. So Kirsty spent three or four days still in the hospital before she could actually go see, you know, go see her daughter. So Matt was the first one to, Matt actually gave his mom instructions on how to handle a preemie. It was really funny. Oh, well, see, my husband and I just had a baby about three months ago now. And, you know, they talk about kangaroo care and how important that is for babies to to be held right away when they're born and how that's bonding. And I bet there's something to that, that Matt was one of the first people to hold Penny, that they really bonded yeah. that way. That's very special. It's a, such a blessing to for our children, of course, to have each other and can already see they're young, but we can already see the friendships mm-hmm. forming between them and how they kind of sharpen each other or sometimes irk yeah. each other also. Of course. <laughs> With that, the blessing of siblings, how has your family been affected by Penny, your diagnosis, and how has that opened your siblings' eyes to, to be more attentive like Matt is, to um, to be more caring and to, to realize where help is needed, not just at home, but in 
you know, outside of the home too. So all in all, how has your family changed after Penny's been born? You know, I, I would suspect at first this was really pretty difficult on Penny's older siblings. Um, they were, uh, the boys were 13, just turning 14, so seventh going into eighth grade. Uh, Justine was in high school. Um, and, and, you know, kids at that age really still need their parents. It's easy to think, oh, they're older, they're more independent. But there's a lot going on uh, for them at that time. And, of course, uh, in the first two months of Penny's life, we were trucking to Milwaukee every day, an hour away, um, you know, trying to balance and juggle all of their needs with her needs. It, it, I, I would think they... Yeah, I work. I was only ready. I imagine now that I'm going through that same phase of life that they were in when I was actually born, I could sympathize and I could think, wow, they must have been. I don't know if that was the right word, mm -hmm. but they must have had for it. Was that meant that they had to work out? Because all of they're going through all their teenage aches and all of a sudden, who I tell up and mom and dad were taking the Biden now. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think you're probably right. Having said that, though, uh, particularly the boys who, who were much more involved in Penny's care than Justine was, because she was a junior, uh, senior in high school and all, you know, kind of much more independent. The Both of my boys um, definitely uh, were very caring, um, at least outwardly, to their little sister. And in general, uh, they tend to be they tend to be people who uh, are particularly concerned about those who might need a bit of help. Um, uh, they're much more understanding. You know, they're in their thirties now, uh, but they're both much more understanding of different people, diverse people, those things that you would expect for young men that age. Uh, so. I would attribute a lot of that to, to having Penny as a younger, younger sister. And they, they were pretty good about doing stuff with you. We yeah. have to ask a lot of times. Uh, now we, we learned that in some cases this was because as 16, 17 year olds, it meant they got a nice parking space because they had a disabled <sighs> person in the car and, yeah. um, and, and that girls enjoyed when they had a little sister uh, in, in tow, but they still <laughs> they really treated their sister pretty nicely. At a, a young age, when your family, this is what you've been um, given in Penny's diagnosis, Penny, this is what you've been given in life. My little ones who don't have a lot of people around them who are of different abilities at this time, what's the best way to teach them how to care and be kind and to open their eyes for helping others of different abilities. You know, it's very interesting because, you know, now our children have children. So Penny is around um, younger nieces and nephews frequently. And it is fascinating to see the way in which they relate to her and how they're learning, um, you know, they're learning uh, how to relate to a person with a disability. Her, uh, our youngest granddaughter, Lily, really is fascinated with Penny. I mean, Lily yeah. get up in Penny's lap. Uh, and Lily always wants to be wherever Penny is. Uh, Lily will, will, will tell you right away if Penny needs something. I think uh, John's son, Kevin, and, and you have a pretty cool little bond, too. Oh. So Kev's uh, in fourth, uh, going into fifth, he's actually in, how can that be? He's in fifth grade now. Uh, but Kevin and Kyla, John's two, uh, two kids, have lived on and off with us. John was in the Navy, so at times uh, they would be with us. 
especially when he got out of the Navy in that transition time, they were with us for a few years. Um, uh, Kevin, especially the two of them, Penny and Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can what are some of the things you, <laughs> yeah, you could tell, you, right? Yeah. Yeah. What, what, um, what were some of the things Kevin, you and Kevin would do for one another? Well, sometimes I really miss it now because I'm st- stuck on the level of Camry Club. And he's really good at that thing. <laughs> and he all the way Andy Crush. to work or whatever it is. And I'm like, man, if only you were here right now. I'm so far from here to be the normal. Because I be like, hey, Kevin, get over here. I'm stuck on the level. <laughs> you'd like to help beating the level in yeah. candy crush i understand <laughs> so and then her kevin's older sister kyla we we had gotten to the point over the last year where she and penny would babysit one another so they were quite the team yeah right penny you know obviously we think would provide the common sense uh <laughs> but kyla the mobility uh, so, yeah, they could make dinner together. Um, you know, they would turn TV stations together, those types of things. They they really uh, should have. She's got a really sweet relationship with 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 the grandkids. No, Penny, do they have they asked you questions about your abilities and what you're able to do or what it's like to be you? Yeah. But other, wait, younger still who I'm around, who aren't in my family, who left me those kinds of questions, and I don't really know how to answer them that kind of awkward. Because this is your reality, correct? Yeah. 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 So, Penny's Penny. Um, you know, so it's hard for her to they play mm-hmm. my disability to of others if that makes sense. You know, she also had classmates in school for four years at Grace because she, she came to Grace in fifth grade. Our our thought our plan when we moved to from Sheboygan uh to Florida, Penny was a kindergartner, and our plan had been to to keep her in public school up until middle school because that's where she got her services. You know, that's where she would get speech therapy, physical therapy, those things. Yeah, but it turns out Wisconsin is better for that stuff than Florida would be. Um, yeah. Medical care is better here and, and more accessible here, uh, yeah. but sir. but sir. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, two, three, four, well, well, we've been service like for people with consonants way. Yeah, way better. So we we brought Penny over to Grace sooner because, as it turned out, our phys ed teacher <laughs> could provide more. Uh, of what you would consider physical therapy than she was getting in the public school. Um, she, she had good friends in the public school, but she had, you know, how a Lutheran school is. It's the same kids, the same 20 or so kids year after year. They just adapted to her being in class. You know, she became a duty. Somebody had penny duty for the week where they would be the, cause at that time she was in a push chair. Um, or somebody would be her scribe. Um, and I found out in high school how difficult that job is. We actually, uh, Florida does have a very nice aid program so that, um, so that kids are able to attend, um, private schools, parochial schools, Christian schools, really good. Uh, and and if a person has a disability, actually that there was more money there than our tuition was. So we were able to hire a classroom aide for her 
Uh, and we actually hired one of our former students who was a uh, college kid. And, and why, don't, why don't you tell stuff about that? And a little bit more, and I actually got to be pretty good friends. And now, even though I'm graduating and she's married, you know, like we've been to race games. So, and we even went to Applebee's to get for her and my her mom died like to so wake me to what the one even that would be cool. And actually she teaches at our school. She's our art teacher at our school because of that. So Penny has impacted well, people's lives pretty significantly. What did, what did your what did some of your teachers from high school say about you like when you graduated? Like uh, I have to because of my disability, I have to do an exit. I need to, in order to close my eye file. No, I get there, and everyone's like, you changed the game, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, this is awkward. <laughs> I don't, I said thank you, but I, I would. And on the inside, I was like, this is making me feel kind of awkward right now. But they, they said to a person they would never look at a person with a disability the same again. Hmm. Well, that makes me think a lot of people do feel awkward when they aren't around people with a disability often. Do you have any advice for um, listeners who, who might not be around people with intellectual or developmental disabilities? Well, remember that just because someone see, has any sort of disability, that we're just as much of a human as more disabled people are and just make us feel included and feel like you're not disrespecting us and putting us down just because we're in a wheelchair or have arms hit on or whatever the case may be. That's really wise advice. God made you. You are valued and loved by your Lord. And that's where, you know, so many um, parents of people who have disabilities will say, you know, but my, my child is perfect. <laughs> my child is perfect. And, and, and they mean by that they're valued and, and loved. And so, um, so yeah, everyone can, can learn to interact with people who have a, a full range of abilities in that way, as someone created and, and loved by God. Absolutely. You, you, when you parent a disabled child, you truly recognize what it means to be human. Uh, it, it means that you have a soul. Uh, it doesn't mean necessarily that you are the football star or the this or the that, um, but rather you have a soul. You have a savior who loves you. You're made in God's image. Uh, Betty has a pretty good sense of humor, you know, to include her in jokes, even to tease her um, like you would tease anybody else, like any dad with the bad jet dad jokes, you know. Yeah, I love those. <laughs> I mean, all of those things, <laughs> all of the things that we think of as a part of the human experience, she experiences. Um, and, and so, although you comment about not being the football star, let's not forget that Jim Nabbit only has the left hand and he's moving the leader to make the ring. You're right, yeah, I stand corrected. Yeah. <laughs> 
sounds like you're a baseball fan, Penny, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. But you bring up a good point. I mean, people have all kinds of abilities like, throughout their entire lifespan. And and sometimes there's skills and, and gifts that, that you know, are, are given and others that are developed. But we're, I mean, we're never, any one of us, um, born with a, you know, full and complete range of abilities that stays the same throughout life. So, you know, I, I love how you said, you never, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's, I mean, that's something I think Penny hopefully agrees with. We would never limit her, right? I mean, we never, Penny would say she'd want to do this and she'd want to do that. We'd figure out a way to do it, wouldn't we? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think you want to limit to anybody, really. So again, the normal is the normal. Like, um, for example, back in the, I guess it was in like, how old was I when we went to that one Ted Williams thing and the Pete Wells fly? Really about 10. Yeah. Pete Wells were flying. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Penny has made friends with, um, because of where we typically sit at Rays games, she's made friends with uh, some of the Rays TV announcers. They know her by name. They'll stop by. They'll, they might sit with us for an inning and, and chat about baseball. Um, people have bothered her to try and start, get her to start writing a baseball blog. Do you think you would do that, Penny? Write a baseball blog. Yeah. What do you want to do? Yeah, what do you think you want to, you see yourself down? What do you mean by? As, a, as you go through college and graduate for a job. Uh, last year, it was like, it's like Paul and Penny, so something either. Wait. Wait, wait, they're doing what? I don't know if they have what. They have sports psychologists. Yeah, we like one of those. I really like sports and I, um, uh, we like five psychology and birthday. So. Finding some way to kind of like combine the two. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah, that's a little shift for her because, but she, she consistently for some time has talked about being a counselor or involved in, in psychology in some way. And Penny, are you in college right now? We are getting there. We're trying to figure out the logistics of life. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Be besides the cerebral palsy, when Penny was a uh, right towards the end of her, oh, you know, yeah, sophomore year of high school, she um, she came down with this really vicious autoimmune uh, disorder called Candace. A lot of people have not heard of it. I hope and pray you never experience it, but it first and. So gets let go. It like into this like weird like I don't really know how to So it's called Pandas. It's pediatric autoimmune neuropsychotic disorder associated with strep. Your body doesn't realize that you're over the strep throat. So it acts like encephalitis for her. Um, so she gets pressure from the brain. Um, so she'll have neuropsychotic symptoms that, that um, if she were able to, quite frankly, she, she could hurt herself. So that's been a blessing in many ways that she's not fully able physically. Um, and we, we keep it under control. They keep it under control with uh, IV treatment and with uh, steroids. So it's created a lot of trouble with COVID. Uh, 
uh, you know, the, the autoimmune compromisation is you have to be very careful with her. Yeah. So that's delayed the start of college because we have to be very careful about being around people, number one. And number two, she needs services for college and voc rehab, who she would work through, is um, they're definitely mm -hmm. feeling the uh, employment pinch. So I think you've had maybe three or four voc rehab counselors in the last two years. Yeah. They keep leaving. You're thinking that period of time with Hadley, what you said, you're different people as my folk we have counselor well, that's mm -hmm. kind of difficult but she was at a college level uh program in high school so she does have a semester of more than a semester of credits at least i'm not sure how many credits i have per se but i have at least a Semester lockdown, I think. Yeah, you do. So that's good. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. Penny and Pastor, we have a, a, the LCMS website. In addition to just our LCMS website, we also have a number of RSOs who provide you know services and resources for families within the church who have members who have an intellectual or developmental disability. And as I was reading through, a common thing that I read across websites in regards to the church is that people and the families who care for them have a very low percentage of church attendance, which would translate to they somehow uh, in some way or another don't feel welcomed or comfortable or cared for within a congregational setting, or it's just hard to walk through the door. And so what can the church do better to serve families and to serve people with disabilities so that that's not something that has to cross anyone's mind? It is true that it's a low percentage of people with disabilities that attend church regularly. Well, what do you think the church could do differently to, to help change that? I think just letting people know that are disabled that, hey, we're here for you and we understand your situation and we can <laughs> yeah this uh, this is going to be another question that's going to be tough for her because again you know, penny's normal is penny's normal so she's um you know she's a good church attender um so it's probably going to be hard for her to think of why and, and she's always been very welcome at the church but you know, so it's hard for me to think of why other people would have that <laughs> because like that was saying i personally don't have that feel thanks be to god, mm -hmm. be to god but I, i'm thinking through this and and i'm not surprised by it i i, I think you see oftentimes in, in congregations the people that you see in the pews are similar to the people that you see up front serving uh, and, and similar to the other uh, staff members in the congregation, right? So, so for example, at Grace right now, we're very blessed. We have a very good young organist. Um, we have these deaconesses that are, um, you know, that let people know that we value women um, you're seeing that we're, e even though we have two uh, grandfather-like pastors, you're seeing a, a, a larger group of young adults in our congregation than we've seen in a long, long time because they see young adults valued. You know, I think in many ways, a, a congregation that, that clearly values disabled people, um, you're likely to see more of them there. So in our, our parish, people have both in Sheboygan when I served there and now here at uh, 
at Grace, you'll see some disabled people there because they, you know, when they see the pastor hugging a, a little girl in a wheelchair and realize that's his daughter, that they, they realize it's a safe place for them. Yeah. Guess what other, what them saying, what other people realize that, hey, this pastor has a child who disabled maybe I feel comfortable here and then they start going mm-hmm. more I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm remembering when I worked for a recognized service organization, you know, an RSO like like Steph mentioned, that provided some resources and support for, for people with um, disabilities that, you know, a lot of times we would be talking to a congregation who would reach out and, and be saying, oh, we've got someone who has this disability uh, or this diagnosis, and we're thinking we ought to do this for them. We, we think we if we did if we could just do this one thing, that would make it easier for them to come to church. And my first question to them was always, well, did you did you talk to the individual? Did you talk to that person and ask them? If they wanted whatever accommodation you're thinking of making, whether it's redesigning the building or putting in something. And um, most of the time they would say, oh, no, no, we just decided that this would be a good thing for them. And I like, well, Mm -hmm. you know what? The people who understand the disabilities best are the ones who are living with it. So my first suggestion is that you have a conversation with with the individual, with their family members and say, how can we best support you? How can we best love you? What do you need to make coming to the worship services or the Bible classes, you know, or or the confirmation classes easier? You tell us what you'd like. And sometimes they would say like, oh, could someone relocate some of these tables so it's easier for my chair to get around? And it didn't have to be the plan that was I don't know, maybe some committee or individuals were, were cooking up um, without talking to them. So I always said, you know, just just have a conversation, just, you know, be the body of Christ, talk to one another and and figure out what the needs are. Because if we're assuming and, and guessing and, and coming up with things, we're doing it not with the, the people who, who matter most, who have the, the most um, wisdom and knowledge around this. Yeah, I kind of acknowledge that people sometimes that I mean certain things that aren't necessarily the types of accommodation that I actually need and that I get to the area and I'm like I'm glad that you made this accommodation for me but it's still difficult for me to use this certain thing because <laughs> you didn't actually listen to what I want you didn't actually ask me hey Penny how can we fix this so that you can use mm-hmm. it I see your point like that people who have that certain disability first before you go thinking well I think we should do this and then we do more to say people would come to our to let's go out of work the thing we need to do is you could somehow survey the same people your area not with Force them to call, but be like, what's your thing if you have not? Don't like come on phone or whatever, but friendly, nice way to say, what, what are the conversations can we make so that more? Disabled people feel comfortable going to our church in your opinion. Very nice. Mm-hmm. Instead of just really, really thinking, I think people with disability would feel more comfortable 
going to our turn to read it. Why, see, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and see, you know, I'm learning along with our listeners. My, my husband is a pastor and we have a smaller congregation, but I love hearing this so that we know how we can be welcoming and actually to to ask you, Penny, what you need um, and how you need to be served so that you feel welcomed and that you can worship with the body of believers. Um, you give us permission to to ask that of you mm-hmm. and, and pastors listening to ask, ask family members, ask Penny herself. Now, Pastor and Penny, you have given us a glimpse into what your beautiful congregation at Grace is like and how they love and support your family and love and support the family of believers together. And that's, you know, in part what it means to be a a pro-life congregation or a congregation that looks at life the way that, that Jesus looks at life. And that's beautiful. Well, well, thank you very much, Steph. We, we appreciate that. Uh, we've been very blessed. And, and so, uh, all we enjoy doing best is is sharing that love of God and Christ Jesus with everyone, uh, recognizing how value how valuable each and every life is to Him. What could be better? Yes, yes. Now maybe I can ask you both, and you can answer individually. But Pastor and Penny, what does it mean to be a child of God? Oh, oh what a what a great question. Do you want to go first? You want me to go first? I think you can go first. You're the one that's the celebrating the green light. <laughs> so she's going to correct me then after I I I give that answer, right? Okay, but, let's scrutinize this, Penny. Yeah, Here let's we- see what we get out of this. But um, really, to be a child of God. Uh, means to be loved by him so much uh, that you recognize and realize, as awesome as it is, that if you were the only person that he ever created, he still uh, would have sent his son into the world to die for you, for me. It, it's an unbelievable thing uh, to me to think that the eternal Son of God would do that. And I think you actually make the same point in your sermon for this weekend. If I oh, you overheard me. <laughs> you, you at least but, had one person listening, Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> but but I agree with you. Just recognizing, realizing that God loves me enough that. Um, he would say to Jesus to die so that I could have eternal life. And there are so many people who unfortunately don't realize that yet. And just waking out, helping those people and being a Good, friendly neighbor, like acting the most like Jesus, that a simple human being can. That to me is what being a child of God means. Beautiful. Beautiful confession. And what a way to witness to your friends, Penny, too, with what you've said that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came into the world to save sinners. It's beautiful. Mm. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, both Pastor and Penny, for joining us today. Oh, you're very welcome, Steph. And, and also, uh, Tiffany, it's, it's been wonderful visiting, uh, visiting with you. Well worth all of the little uh, niggling <laughs> uh, technical issues that we had to start with. We did. We endured a little bit uh, prior to this recording, and I thank you for that, too. And, um, and of course, Tiffany, thank you for, for joining me. Do you have um, any resources that you can point our listeners to? Yeah, you know, in LCMS Life Ministry, we um, get a lot of questions about 
teaching the faith um, to people who have a, a range of abilities. And um, you know, certainly on our, our website on lcms.org, we've got uh, a whole slew of, of um, resources, some um, uh, connections to our recognized service organizations like uh, Voice of Care or Able Light that, that offer um, curriculum and um, confirmation instructional materials um, for people who have disabilities. Um, and so, you know, you could go to lcms.org and, and just type in um, disability in, in the search bar. Um, our, we had a task force that has come up um, also with assessment tools for um, taking a look at your congregation and saying, you know, how, how is it that you can engage with, with families and, and with people who have disabilities and um, see what they need from your church, how, how um, accessible is your church. So, um, yeah, certainly go to um, lcms.org. And, and find some of those resources and, and connections to other Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, recognized service organizations that may have some things that might be helpful. Oh, you know, we're also always here to um, just in, engage with people directly. Um, the, probably the easiest way is for people to, to email first, and we can have a phone conversation or um, even connect them with, you know, really experienced pastors like like Pastor Lockren, who, who could um, share advice. I'm, I'm putting you on the spot here a little bit, Pastor, but I, I imagine that if I were to call you up someday and say, hey, would you talk to a pastor at, at another church, um, that you'd probably be willing to do that. So um, if if folks would find the, the personal connection um, to be helpful, email us at lifeministry at lcms.org, um, and we can help you engage with the, a network of, of, you know, the body of believers and, and, and help you to really in your congregation, be, be welcoming people with disabilities. Thank you. And thank you, of course, to our listeners for tuning in. If you liked what you heard, please leave us a review. And don't forget to click the follow or subscribe button so you don't miss out on upcoming episodes. New episodes drop twice each month. And you can find us on Facebook and Instagram as Friends for Life LCMS. And finally, listeners, we want to hear from you. Do you have an idea about a guest you'd like to hear from or a topic you want talked about? Email us at friendsforlife at lcms.org. We want to hear from you about what you want to hear about when it comes to issues of life. Thanks for joining us. Friends for Life is a podcast that introduces listeners to life issues by introducing them to friends who stand for life. Friends for Life.